I'm going to present about the social cultural history and also the present of ayahuasca. And I want to start this presentation with a question that we're going to go back in the end uh, about what is science. So there are many definitions of science, and most of them involve similar variables, such as in the understanding the natural world, understanding the social world, observation, measurement, experimentation, and so on. And I like very much this one, which is from the Cambridge Dictionary definition that states that science is the careful study of the structure and behavior of the physical world, especially by watching, measuring, and doing experiments and the development of theories that describe the results of these activities. So moving to ayahuasca. Um, ayahuasca is a word from the Quechua language, commonly translated into English as vine of the soul. And it refers to an Amazonian vine scientifically named by B. Kaapi and to a brew known also by other names such as Camarampi, Uni, Nishipai, Iage, Daimi, Vegetal, among many other names. Most of these names, they belong to the Amazonian indigenous uh, people that use ayahuasca, which nowadays are around 160 nations. And the brew is prepared according to different recipes, including combinations with um, even 90 different potential plant additives to, to the vine. But the most common are P. viridis and D. cabrerana, and P. viridis is also known as chacruna from the Quechua as well, meaning to mix. And it is this species that contains DMT, but there are others as well used by indigenous people in, in different places in the Amazon that also contain the DMT. Um, and much like the classical psychedelics ayahuasca use has been associated with a range of positive therapeutic outcomes, including the um, alleviation of depression and addictions. So, yeah, this is B. Kaapi, this is P. Viridis, and this is the Cabricana. So, now in the next slides, I'll give you a journey on time on some relevant events of ayahuasca. So, botanists have suggested that B. Kaapi probably emerged during the late Ice Age. And it's not possible to say when the practice of drinking ayahuasca originated, but there is archaeological evidence that suggests its use occurred since 2000 BC. The earliest written account evidence that suggests its use, um, uh, the earliest, sorry, uh, written account of ayahuasca was done by the Jesuit missionaries. And the first one to describe it was Jose Hantre Ejera, uh, but his descriptions included indigenous peoples as liars and sorcerers. And then the priest Pablo Maroni wrote about an intoxicating potion ingested for divinatory. Then Juan Magnin, um, on his experience in Quito, did other writings, followed by the Jesuit Franz Vego, who traveled down the Napo River in Peru and deemed Bicapi a plant worth mentioning. But for the most part, their diabolical fears didn't allow the brew easy entry into European imagination. And such an entry had to wait until the 1800s when botanist Richard Spruce and geographer Manuel Villaviencio experienced ayahuasca um, themselves and described their, what they call, cosmic journeys, um, which are part of Alfred Wallace's book of narratives on the Amazon and the sharings of ayahuasca with Europeans. So, 
here is um, a picture of Spruce uh, collection, which was the first collection, official, official collection, of course, because the indigenous have been collecting, but the official one for Westerns. Um, and descriptions of Bikapi, and this is from the Kew Gardens private collection, which I had the opportunity to have access to while bringing some of the Huni Queen people um, to a visit there last year. And uh, for me, it was very incredible to see the indigenous seeing what they actually collected first, <laughs> being presented to them themselves, <laughs> saying that this was the first collection of ayahuasca. <laughs> and, but yeah, they loved it uh, with all their uh, humility as always and honoring for uh, learning something new, you know. And the descriptions, um, like handmade, and they were just like really impressed to, to read as well. Then um, that came the rubber boom, uh, which was terrible for the indigenous people. They were enslaved, their cultures were almost exterminated, and they already had lost a lot with the missionaries uh, just before the, the boom not just before, but the first invasion, let's say like this. And, uh, but the ayahuasca use didn't disappear. And in 1905, Colombian chemist Rafael Bayon named the, at that time, still unextracted active uh, ingredient of ayahuasca, telepatin, uh, due to the telepathic effects of the vine. And this name was actually retained um, when the alkaloid was first isolated in 1923 by another Colombian chemist, Guillermo Cardenas. And back in Brazil in 1913, the first ayahuasca religious group was founded, uh, Círculo de Regeneração e Fé, uh, by Raimundo Irineu, which is now well known as Mestre Irineu. He was a rubber tapper who, after uh, Círculo de Regeneração e Fé, founded the Santo Daime. And in 1925, Barriga Vilauba and Alba Hassin isolated an alkaloid that they called Iajin, thanks to the name of Iajé, of the, the indigenous from Colombia. And shortly afterwards, Peho and Ahmed in 1927 suggested that telepatin was identical to Iagin. Then uh, between 1928 and, and 31, the German pharmacologist Louis uh, Lewin named the compound banisterin and decided to investigate its effects on Park Parkinson's disease. And this was the first experiment with, big experiment with ayahuasca. And at the same time, uh, German ethnobotanists Elder Wolf and Rumpf uh, identified that banisterin was the same as harmine. And in 31, um, the DMT molecule was first chemically synthesized by another German chemist, Richard uh, Mansk. And finally, in 38, Chen and Chen published an article affirming that telepatin, banisterin, and iagin were all the same as harming. Then, uh, between 1941 and 1953, I think I was, okay. Um, the, another Richard, this time the American biologist Richard Schultz, spent almost 17 years in the Amazon uh, experimenting with different indigenous people and different medicines, and then published um, a very famous book called Plants of Gods about many of the, the medicines, not just ayahuasca, that the indigenous people use in the Amazon. And then back in Brazil in the 40s, uh, the Brazilian chemist Osvaldo Gonçalves extracted the DMT molecule from Mimosa tenuiflora, another plant that is used to do ayahuasca as well. And its psychedelic properties were after recognized as a natural compound followed by the self experiments of Hungarian psychiatrist Stefan Zara. Then DMT has now been isolated from different living beings. And in the 60s, another 
Church is Formed in Brazil, União do Vegetal, by Mestre Gabriel. And, and then this church really spread quickly around Brazil and around the world. Following uh, Schultz's path, authors William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg uh, published a collection of their ayahuasca experiences, what um, was titled as the IAG Letters. And in 1972, Mark Dobkin publishes Visionary Vine, a first major study of urban ayahuasca shamanism. And in the 70s, following mm -hmm. Mestre Irineu, Padrinho Sebastião, uh, another Brazilian registered C. Fluris, which later became the main propagator of uh, Santo Daime. But it's really on the 90s that ayahuasca gets popular due to the work of uh, ethnobotanist and writer Terence McKenna and anthropologist Jeremy uh, Narby. And in 1991, a large study on the health and safety of ayahuasca by UDV, UDV members starts and the project is known as the OASCA project and the final report declares that ayahuasca is totally safe and not addictive. In 2002, Benny Shannon, an Israeli cognitive psychologist, published, published what is now widely known as one of the main studies of ayahuasca, the Antipodes of the Mind. And one decade, decade after his book, Neuroscientists, uh, scientists in Brazil first scanned the brains of people drinking ayahuasca. And then after that, um, ayahuasca became the subject of many studies that have been debated in different arenas, such as here, uh, but especially the World Ayahuasca Conferences organized by ICERs. But uh, another very important arena that such a such debates happen is uh, in the Indigenous Ayahuasca Conference, that it's uh, now in its fourth edition. The fifth edition is going to happen next year. Uh, it always happens in the Amazon. It's just for Indigenous peoples, and there, there are different groups from different places in the Amazon. And they, they have um, made a lot of dec important decisions. There is a website if you were interested on that and some letters and declarations that came up from the past conferences. And although being still illegal in many places, we now have what has been called the ayahuasca diaspora, uh, with many retreats happening both in the forest and all around the world, being organized by indigenous and non-indigenous people. And numerous patents on DMT have been uh, filed, as well as the first uh, medical grade drug candidate of ayahuasca is also being being developed. So, um, just to give um, an idea of the the different uh, types of ayahuasca, so there are many recipes uh, to do it, and um, here are just some examples. But it always depends on the group, on, on the type of the plants, on the type of the vine, and what is mixed, and how it is brewed. And the most used one and, and common is the yellow ayahuasca, but indigenous people affirm that there, there are different kinds, uh, have different effects, and they may actually have different chemical compositions. And the botanical identification of all these uh, varieties has not yet been possible, but there are the different kinds have native names and a native classification. So moving on to the traditional and, and scientific practices, um, the brew has been used by shamans for healing, magic, divination, and social rituals. One of the primary purposes is the diagnosis of illness, but also to help in different aspects of the community on where to find um, good places to hunt, and when they need to find a new medicine as well to heal something new. And always while using ayahuasca, uh, normally the shaman will chant, and chanting is their form of praying and, and communicating with other than human beings. 
in, in Brazil and in other places as well, ayahuasca is widely used in communal ceremonies that involve dancing, singing, playing instruments, and the importance of the ritual is really key as it implies a kind of continuity of the past, a sense of like you were learning something that has been passed down generations. And, and it brings a sense of unity as well. And unity not just with each other, but with other than, than human beings. And the Yawanawa, for example, which um, uh, is an indigenous group from Acre in Brazil, they name ayahuasca Uni. And this, is, this name is because according to them, by drinking Uni, we have an opportunity to unite, to expand the family. And here the family is not just uh, our family, our ancestors, but the very old ancestors, the, the other than human beings that were here before us, including different plants, animals, and, and even inanimate beings, rocks, and, and so on. So it is from this engagement uh, with these different beings that knowledge about the natural world emerges, according to them. And it's important to think as well that during these ceremonies, uh, there are other medicines being used, such as tobacco, for example, and, and other plants um, and, and sort of like teas and, and other things that you can mix together uh, while using ayahuasca as well for healing. And But what happens now is that uh, there is this modern tendency to view ayahuasca primarily as a vehicle for making DMT orally active, uh, while such a framing might allow uh, sort of like integration uh, with Western medicine. It also obscures the diversity of ayahuasca preparations, and, and some of these preparations don't even include DMT. Uh, so it's a kind of like narrowing something into the the substance that we kind of want to know more about, which is currently DMT. And a concept more directly related with indigenous people's practices would be the concept of medicine or master teaching spirit instead of molecule or psychedelic. Uh, also, there are many diets that indigenous people, they do uh, for expanding the consciousness and for having uh, the, all the benefits of their medicines. And they are very, very important in different traditions. And, and so they combine the intake of some plants, um, but also the restriction of some um, aliments and sexual abstinence and social isolation. And so that the medicines can work better in your body, but also you can have more visions, you can dream um, and, and find uh, the answers and find the visions that you, you need in your dreams. And this also contrasts um, heavily with the scientific uh, explanatory model that we have, uh, where the mind is the paramount. And in Amazonian conceptions, the healing actually typically happens through the body. That's why the importance of, of the diet and the ritual and the dancing and the chanting and all the, the other things. So just by thinking that the gut is the part of the body that processes ayahuasca, what some people call our other brain, we could uh, already expand the possible understandings of, of it. So all these differences in traditional practices and scientific practice for looking at ayahuasca led to a movement among indigenous people to reclaim the ethics that Western science should pay attention to. And, and some of them get together to publish this article last year uh, to guide psychedelic science. And they established what they have called the eight R's which are reverence, respect, responsibility, relevance, regulation, reparation, restoration, and reconciliation for their knowledge. So um, what are the implications for uh, 
for the indigenous people in terms of all this that I've presented here. They, they have the right um, to maintain, and this is something uh, internationally recognized already, to maintain, to control, to protect, and develop their bioculture heritage, their traditional knowledge, and all their cultural expressions. And considering the high demand to treat millions of depressed patients, the medicalization of ayahuasca without the adequate regulation and recognition of these rights can be really harmful to them. Also, validating indigenous knowledge through non-indigenous methods can also generate epistemic conflicts and possible injustice. So when we, as scientists and Westerns, we go there and we validate what they are doing through our methods, we are actually invalidating because we are not really um, legitimizing their practice and, and their experience and their methods for um, using these medicines. Uh, it's almost like it's needed that we prove that they work, you know. <laughs> and ayahuasca tourism as well has not always been conducted ethically and sustainably. So it's something that it's starting to, to worry as well. And as like a Brazilian, and my first graduation was actually in law. So I, at some point, I was very worried about all these things. And I spoke with um, one of the Yawanawa elders that I work with about all this. And I asked him that he was not, if he was not afraid about cultural appropriation and all these things. And he was so calm looking at me. And he answered like, you know, my daughter, <laughs> we knew this was going to happen. Our ancestors always told us that one day the white people would come and would ask us about the medicines and that, that we would have the duty to share. And the medicines are not ours. <laughs> they are gifts from the forest, so we need to share them. And I was like, Ooh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then he continued, the knowledge is ours. And without the knowledge, you wouldn't know how to use the medicines. So this is something that everybody needs to, to recognize. And, and according to the letter um, that came out from the last indigenous ayahuasca conference, they are actually very keen to share not just ayahuasca, but the many other medicines that they have in the forest. Um, for, for their belief, they, they re really think that we need each other at this moment of time. You know, it's not just about their medicines and their knowledge and not just about our medicines and our knowledge. We need to hold hands to really achieve the transformation um, to, to keep alive, I would say. So going back uh, to the first slide, to me, the Amazonian shamans are great scientists. They are always looking for something, have always been great experimenters. And the discovery of ayahuasca uh, emerged not just as a gift from nature, but um, also as a result for their constant research and work and alchemy. And if, if we do not take this into consideration while we're studying ayahuasca, if we just isolate the chemicals that look interesting to us and forget about the other practices, we risk decontextualizing a traditional medicine and losing many uh, important aspects of it. It's um, important to keep in mind that healing is not just about the substance. And this is also a result of the extractive logic that we all live in. And it's now the time to try to overcome some logic and include more collaborative methods um, and so on. So they may not speak the same scientific language as ours, but they have been experimenting with the biodiversity around them for centuries. And to achieve this sophistication of alchemy, it took it would take us like really many years um, of of at the level of sophistication that they have to offer. Not to speak about the different cosmologies uh, involving their medicines, which could be um, a topic for a new entire presentation. And the elders are also passing away, so we don't have much time to learn. Um, from these alchemies and these um, cosmologies. 
So I'm going to finish with this quote from João Paulo Tucano, um, which uh, graduated um, as a PhD now. <laughs> and he, yeah, he says that it's not just about the chemical, it's also about the experiences and the other elements that are involved in, in the use of their medicines. Thank you. Obrigada. <laughs>